Hi, I'm Jeremy Kirk with Intel 471, and this is Happy Hunting, which is Intel 471's threat hunting program. With me today is Lee Arkinall, who is Senior Threat Hunt Analyst. How are you doing, Lee? Doing great. Thanks for having me. We're going to discuss a specific ransomware group today called Black Basta, which has been the subject of a lot of recent discussion. As some of you may be aware, someone leaked nearly 197,000 chat messages from this group that spanned a nine-month period. The chat messages have revealed an incredible amount about how this gang ran, how it organized itself, and even imparted some tips to the real-world identities of some of the main players in the group. It's also given us great insight into the the tactics, techniques, and procedures used by Black Blasta during these intrusions. Our analysts have been studying these messages to extract the TTPs and have updated our threat hunt packages based on these techniques, of which Lee is going to discuss in a little bit. Just a little bit more background about Black Blasta. The gang appeared in early 2022 and was composed of veteran Russian-speaking threat actors, uh, some of whom were associated with the notorious Conti ransomware group. Black Basta adopted the same kind of professional cybercrime model as Conti. They ran phishing sites. They had penetration testers. They employed cryptors to crypt malware. They ran call centers that actively called victims and tried to get them to install malware. And they had ransom negotiators. The group had at least two offices in Moscow, and the highest manager of the group claimed to have influential contacts in Russia that helped protect the group. They kept spreadsheets of organizations that they wanted to attack and lists of victims. They even had their own initial access malware and botnets, which they used to uh, deliver loader malware, which is kind of malware that's used to deliver uh, other follow-on malware. Over the last few months, Black Basta had slowed down a bit. Uh, the chats had indicated that there was some internal turmoil in the group, and we've only seen eight purported victims uh, listed in January 2025. And since the release of the chat messages, which occurred on February 11th, 2025, there have been no more victims listed. So one of the attack behaviors used by Black Basta is using living off the land binaries or lol bins, which are native Windows tools that get abused by adversaries. So ransomware groups such as Black Basta, Nokoyawa, and other attackers using remote access trojans such as Spectre and SysJoker have used Windows Management Instrumentation Command Line Utility, or WMI. Uh, this is used for managing machines and data, uh, allows for setting up automation and running custom scripts. Threat actors using this, it avoids them having to install custom malware on machines that might be detected because these tools are already there. They're unlikely to raise security concerns. So with this though, however, because this is malicious use of a legitimate tool, it can be detected in threat hunting. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Lee, who's gonna talk about in greater depth how Black Basta used WMI in attacks. So over to you, Lee. Thanks, Jeremy. As usual, all this great intelligence is nothing unless you make it actionable. So how do we make this actionable? This is kind of like a tough one because normally we take these videos, we take this intelligence that's presented to us, and then we try to get some quick wins, right? Quick wins normally fall in the line with the IOCs, you know, indicators of compromise, which are hashes, file names, and so on. But what we're dealing with right now is a piece of software that exists on every Microsoft Windows machine. It's Windows Management Instrumentation, or WMI. The term is a living off the land binary, meaning it's going to be there. So the adversary expects it to be there, so they know they can leverage it. Um, so the best quick win that I found here is to really just disregard the uh, application itself, forget the hashes, and let's go straight to the behaviors. For example, we often see actors abusing WMI for discovering enumeration to execute remote code, and in some cases, to actually detonate the ransomware that was dropped in the environment previously. Lee, I have a question for you about WMI. And so when they're using that for discovering enumeration, are they trying to figure out like the number of boxes in an environment, the number of file shares and things of that nature? So when it comes to WMI, it's really, really powerful. And they can actually use it to find out tons of different things. Um, when it comes to WMI enumeration discovery, they can find out information about your local machine. They can find out information about remote systems. 
Uh, they can find out if you have like a USB drive plugged in. There's a lot of different things that they can use. So really, I guess the answer is that it's only limited to the knowledge of the adversary of how much they can use WMI because it really, really is a really powerful tool. And it was even used to execute code remotely on machines that the ransomware had been dropped on. So it's it's kind of like a jack of all trades whenever it comes to uh, living off land binary. Thanks. Yeah, not a problem. And, and what's even worse is that it's not just limited to one threat actor or malware. This has been seen being used in attacks that involve Gootloader, Quantum Ransomware, Iced ID, and the list just goes on. And I don't mean to you know strike fear, but the question is, if it's being used so much, how can we help find the malicious and suspicious from the normal traffic? So talking about WMI abuse, our hunt package, WMIC Windows Internal Discovery Enumeration. Now, the, the, the first question that might come across your mind is, what is WMIC? We were just talking about WMI. Well, the, the C at the end there, all it is is it's referencing the command line interface that WMI has. So if you can think about typing in a terminal and running some commands. But what we've done is we've looked at what a threat actors have done in the past, and we've added those parameters that are more geared towards discovery and enumeration, because like I said, there's a lot of use for WMI. So there's a lot of things that can be done with it. And in this case, we really want to focus on the command line arguments containing path or get or list because these are the you know the parameters that the adversary can use to discover information about the machine or in the environment they landed on yes they can do many other things but what we didn't want to do is <laughs> give you a query that says look for wmi activity you know that's just a little too broad and a little crazy but th these help indicate the intention of the command which if you know and understand the intention of the command, for example, enumeration discovery, that may give you an idea of where they are in their the attack. So hopefully this is capturing it as far left on the minor attack matrix or as early on in the, the attack, then, you know, whenever the ransomware node pops up. So this would kind of be in the reconnaissance phase. That is that where it would fall on the spectrum? I would say uh, internal reconnaissance is another term I've heard, but this is past initial access and probably past execution because if initial access was a phishing email or a link or malicious document, then something was probably triggered that gave the adversary access. So this, this might be a script, this might be hands on keyboard, but at the same time, it's still just discovering what's in their environment, what they can use to their advantage and, and so on. Gotcha. Um, but yeah, so that, those are the the operators that we're looking at. And what that looks like in our tool of choice, of course, going to be Splunk. Because I love Syslon and I love Splunk. So all we did was we built a query, included all the ORs and the logic and WMIC as needed. But let's jump into the tool to see what type of data it returns. So once we take our query and drop it in our tool, this is what we see. And this is kind of what we should expect the data to look like. Now, we created a time bucket up here with a span of two minutes. So almost indicating that talking again about the time frame, if something's firing off within two minutes, then we can almost assume that it's either like a playbook driven where someone is following an attack plan and they're just typing codes. That is if they have keyboard access at this point. Or it's a script that was dropped as part of the uh, initial infection vector, right? If it was a PowerShell script or a malicious document that said, hey, run this and send the information somewhere else, then it would be quick because it's not supposed to linger around. So we'd like to think about that if there's a bunch of commands being executed within a short amount of time, then that, that, that kind of indicates non-human interaction. Um, but so, you know, we're looking at our two minute window, which we found, and we have four unique commands that were run. And we see that they were trying to get uh, operating system information, they're getting uh, a path to physical media. They're getting the serial number itself, looking at IP addresses and so on. But this is kind of what you can expect the data to look like. Now, where would we go from here? As always, I would like to take a step back, take a look at the parent process, see what other activity exists around here, because this type of commands, they provide information. 
they output information. They don't continue the infection by generating different processes, right? It's not like command is spawning PowerShell, which will do other things. It's just outputting information. So that's why I like to take a step back, see whether activity exists around it, and then, you know, try to find root cause. Where did this come from? Who was the unlucky person to click the phishing link? And so on. I've actually got yeah. another question for you. Going back to that screenshot. And so the parameter was that all those actions happened within two minutes. And so is that kind of like the scope for, I guess, suspected malicious behavior that that happened in, in that short time span? Or is it those specific commands too, which maybe, I don't know, aren't used frequently? So it's it's um, a bunch of discovery and enumeration style commands or or, or parameters mass with a short amount of time. Now that, that time can be modified absolutely to be longer or shorter if you want. And it's also the distinct count of the command line arguments that are found. So the get, the path, the um, the list. If there's if they're seen a bunch of times within a short amount of time, you can almost assure that that's, that's kind of what's happening. Now, if you don't get information back or, or results back, you can absolutely start to chunk out or, or expand that time window to three, five, 10, just to get to see if you are seeing data. Because if not, then you have a visibility problem. But then if you get results, but you look at them and say, well, that's our admin, then uh, it could be a false positive that you don't have to investigate, right? Legitimate business as usual work. That was my next question. How do you differentiate that from a false positive? Oh, perfect. Well, the, the, the problem with false positives is they're different between every environment. Um, depending on who's doing it. And that's an easy one is to say, does this fit the profile? Should an HR or finance analyst be doing this WMI activity? Probably not. Uh, you know, is the CEO doing this? If not, you know, like, even with the admins, you know, if you are to start seeing it, then, then from there, the goal is to almost create a pattern of life. How often do they use these? Is there any real outliers that like, they're all the same every single time except this one. And what was that? What was that about? That, that's where the threat hunting actually gets hard because it's applying tribal knowledge to your environment. Great. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. So as you look at this query in the data in the hunt package that you may notice that we use this hunt package way, 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 way back in episode three of the Happy Hunting series when we were covering Vault Typhoon. So a question you may have is, you know, why are you showing us the same thing? Well, because our wonderful content creators, the people who put these hunt packages together, what they do is they are based off of behaviors and not indicators of compromise. These are really able to be used and applied to multiple threats. Because this is such a common behavior that's been used by multiple actors, malwares, and seen in multiple attacks, you're actually able to cover a wider area of threats than you would be if you were just grabbing IOCs and applying them to a query. So it really allows our hunt packages to withstand the, the test of time. Well, that's a wrap for this happy hunting episode. To recap, we took a deep dive into the Black Bass to leaks and a bunch at Intel uh, we got to know them a little bit better thanks to Jeremy. And then we took a closer look at how attackers abuse WMI for discovery and enumeration and how you can catch it. If you haven't already, grab your free Hunter community account to access the WMIC Windows Internal Discovery and Enumeration Hunt Package and start tracking this activity in your own environment. Stay tuned for more insights in the next episode. Until then, stay safe and as always, happy hunting.